So this morning, we we're going to start with the story of the prodigal son. And uh, this is a story that we often, uh, uh, we've grown so comfortable, so used to, so, uh, so, we, how know it, so we know how it goes that we often just kind of gloss over the hard parts. We gloss over the jarring, jarring parts of the story that cause us to take a step back and to look at who we are and what we do. And we know how the story goes. The younger son comes up to his father and says, I want, I want my inheritance. And the father says, okay, I'll give you your inheritance. Already we should begin to remember that this was uh, something difficult that was being done. That you didn't just go and do this. It wasn't like he just was going to transfer half of his uh, uh, our. I've got one of those things for retirement. Now I can't think what the word is. 401K. Thank you. 401k. I kept it. 401k, 501c3. You know, I kept running all these numbers in the tax code in my head just going, wait, none of them is right. It wasn't as easy as just taking half of his 401k and giving it to his son and doing that. This was, this was an event in doing that where the younger son was saying, well, you know, it's basically dead to me now. I'm just going to take my stuff and go. Um, it tore at the identity of the family and the community that they were a part of. That was hard. That was hard to do. That was, he was taking himself out of the family, and then the family itself had to recover from that. And so the younger son goes on, he finds himself in a place where he can go and have a good time, and he goes out there and he wastes all of his money, as many translations of Scripture will say, in extravagant living. And uh, then all of a sudden a famine hits the land. That wasn't unusual in those times for that to happen. That happened on a fairly regular basis. And he found himself with no money in a place he didn't know, with no family and no community around him. So he did the only thing he could. He went and he found work wherever he could find it. And in his case, that was working to feed hogs. Think about just how that would have impacted someone who grew up in a time, in a society, in a culture, in a faith that said, those animals are unclean. And here he is feeding them and finding himself envious of them. That all that he wants is just, even just some of the food that they're eating because he is so hungry. That's a kind of dirty that doesn't come off in the shower. It's kind of dirty that is hard to clean. And, and he didn't, didn't know what to do with that. And so finally, he, uh, we could say he hits rock bottom, but that doesn't really begin to describe where he was in that moment. He says, you know, I remember back home, the workers were my father. They were treated well. They had everything that they needed. Maybe if I go home, I'll, maybe I can go home as one of his hired hands, and that'll be okay. Now, uh, he does that, and we, coming from a Christian standpoint, we look at that and we say, Oh, well, there is, he is asking for forgiveness now. He, he, is, he knows what it is that he has done, and he knows what that means. And, and so now he's asking for forgiveness, and he's going to go back, and now uh, is he going to receive it? And when he goes back, and as the story goes, the father sees him from a long way off. And when he sees him, runs out to him and embraces him, puts a ring on his finger and a rope on him, and tells the servant to go prepare the fattened calf for a feast and for a celebration for this day. And uh, we read that from our place as being a, a great story of forgiveness and it is but sometimes we miss just how deep and profound that forgiveness is for the father to go and, and to do that because it wasn't just that he was forgiving the son for this thing that he had done but this was uh, he was setting the tone for how everyone else would respond to him afterwards because in doing what the younger son did, that was a huge, that was a huge sin. It was something that, that would have been felt by the entire community around him. And if anyone else had seen him, that younger son afterwards, they know exactly what they would have done. So when the father goes from a long way off, there are, there's a reason why we're told that it was from a long way off. And it wasn't just that he had good eyesight. He just happened to be looking out the window one day and looked down and saw him there. But he was watching watching for the son to come back. So when he got back, he could be the first one there. The first one there to go and to respond and to share with everyone else, this is how we're going to deal with this. Because it would have been really easy to just offer judgment in that moment. Uh, in fact, that would have been what everyone else around them would have done. But 
uh, as you read through Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you find out what the judgment is for this case. Now, uh, historians and Jewish scholars are, are, are some of the first that will say it was probably very unlikely that any, any time we read in the Old Testament where the death penalty is prescribed as punishment that it ever actually happened. It, because they wouldn't be very careful in making sure that if they ever did that, that they didn't, that it was warranted and that the person was guilty and they didn't want to have that guilt on them if they did it badly, if they did it wrong. And so it was unlikely that they ever did that. But that was the punishment that was prescribed in Scripture for breaking that commandment to honor thy father and thy mother. And yet, there goes the father. He goes up to the son. He comes in. And in embracing him and giving these things and calling him his son, he is saying for all the rest of the world, there is no sin here. There is no judgment here. But I am welcoming him back. And no one else can argue with him at that point. Because no one else has any standing because the father is saying there's no sin. There is no sin at this moment any longer. Now, where we struggle with this is that um, we uh, we want to know, but we want to know that there's something there that that someone needs to be different. They need to know what it is they have done wrong, and more importantly, behind all of that is always this question of they need to know just how they have hurt hurt those that have been impacted by this. And uh, uh, but that's all judgment. Judgment is not faith. Judgment is not grace. Instead, we remember back to where we started this series a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, this wasn't just a series where I could make fun, tasty things and share with everybody, although I have enjoyed that part of it. Um, I promise there's nothing fancy that I made for you today, although if you do go downstairs and stay for lunch, I did make meatloaf. So um, that's not super exciting, I know. But uh, it's there. Um, but we're going to join our own feast and celebration today. Uh, there's no fattened calf there unless uh, someone got really excited to stick something out on a smoker uh, earlier. I mean, we couldn't that way, but, but it will be a good, fun feast and joy and celebration for us today. But where we remember is that ours is not judgment. And sometimes we think, well, does that mean someone gets off scot free? No, ours is accountability. Because with accountability, then there is hope for reform. There is hope for new creation, just as Adam and Eve had when they when they first bit from the apple. You can't unbite an apple. When you start to peel that apple, you can't un you can't put the peel back on and have it go back to the way it was. But what can happen, and what we watch God do from the very beginning, is that He sets His path of redemption for all His people. That even though they did what they shouldn't have done, they sinned, and then they were kicked out of the garden. God didn't just look at them and say, don't let the door hit you in the butt on the way out. Uh, and he said, I'm going to be with you still. And then work with them and work throughout all of the Old Testament and all of our history so that they can find and so that we can find redemption and hope. And so when the father goes back to the younger son and welcomes him in, he knows that their relationship had been broken before this. But he doesn't offer judgment, he offers forgiveness. Knowing that they're going to build something new from here, because that is the hope of our redemption, is that we have new life. That we are different from that point going forward than we had been in the past, and that is the way that it works, because we can't go back to the way that things were, because if not, we're going to end up in the same place that we, that we got to. Because that's what happens when we go back to exactly the way things were. But we can be different. We can have hope for the future. We can do differently, live differently, be differently, be that new creation that as we receive and as we offer forgiveness and hope and redemption so that we can seek out to be, live a life in that new creation that God has promised for all of us. And for us, as people of faith, we are called to do the same as that Father did. And that is the challenge for us, is that we offer that kind of grace, that kind of forgiveness that says, there is no sin here. Now we're going to figure out how do we build this back? Because what we don't get in that story is how they went forward from there. Because that was going to be a hard challenge, that was going to take a lot of time, that was going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort. But now there was hope for them to build something new, different than what it was before. But knowing that God was with them to create that new, that new life that they were going to build, that was going to mend the broken relationship and make it into something new, something different. Something that was more whole and more complete than what it had been in the past. And that is our hope for us as people of faith.
We live in a world that oftentimes wants to be wants to have that rush to judgment because everyone wants to get their pound of flesh in. But that's not faith and that's not grace. We're called to something different. We're called to offer forgiveness with hope of, of, uh, of something new being made that takes what has happened, that takes it and uses it, takes the power of that sin away from it so that God's new life can be found. That is our hope for us, and that is our hope for us as we go into this Thanksgiving week. Where we go, we offer our thanks, we offer our hope, we offer uh, all the blessings that we have received in the last year, but also we can go and we can offer uh, hope for a new future, for a new life, for a new creation that, that comes because we do that hard thing that is much more difficult than uh, just making judgment but offering forgiveness and grace, and then saying, if there is hope that something new can be made from this, let us be a people that offers that gift and that hope that through this time, through this season, and as we go into this new year. Let us do all of this in the name of the one who came and showed it to us so that we could have hope for that future. Let us do this in the name of Christ. Amen.